Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first uh, UMOFA talk. I'm very excited today because this, this is the first episode of what we hope will become a regular series of webinars. But we'll invite experts from the UMOFA team, as well as other guests, to discuss cutting edge topics in fishery and aquaculture. The name of this new web series, as I said, is UMOFA Talks. And today we're launching it with a super interesting topic the blue bioeconomy. Um, our most affectionate readers might remember that UMOFA mostly deals with the traditional um, bioecon bioeconomy. There is fish and aquaculture products for food use. However, in uh, 2018, uh, UMOFA released the first bioeconomy report, where we took a look at what, what else can be done from fish, shellfish and algae, besides, uh, well, besides eating them uh, sustainably, of course. And the report was quite a success in its own right, and it was decided to make a regular publication out of it with an update every other year. In May 2019, we hosted a workshop at the European Maritime Day in uh, Lisbon, where we presented the first uh, Blue uh, Bioeconomy report, and we asked participants uh, what topics they would have liked us to cover in the second edition. And that's where we are now, uh, the second UMOFAS Blue Bay Economy report was released in December 2020, and it covers three interesting topics we're going to talk about today. Integrated multitrophic aquaculture, a case study on the use of fish restaurant material in Denmark, cellular mariculture and cell plant technology. And you might have noticed that I'm not alone here. Uh, I have the pleasure to be spending the next uh, hour or so with a terrific panel of experts, um, I dare say friends. Um, I'm going to have here today Meredith Lloyd Evans from BioBridge. Um, you can wave your hand, Meredith, thank you, uh, who will uh, tell us about integrated multitrophic aquaculture. Um, Eric Hess from Contali Analyze who has done some quite interesting research on the use of fish restaurant material, and we're going to hear about that. We've got Pierre Hervest from Biomarine, who will unveil the mystery of cellular mariculture and cell plant technology. And we will have Maris Stolgis from the European Commission, the Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, who will tell us what the Commission is doing to support this, this sector. And very important, please note that throughout the webinar, you can ask questions to my guests through the questions tab. I can promise we'll have time to read all of your questions, but the plan is to read at least a few of them. So just don't be shy. If you have a question, just shoot. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome my first guest. Um, Meredith Lloyd Evans. Uh, Meredith is uh, Managing Director at BioBridge in Cambridge, UK. Originally a, a vet, he has gained a 40 years experience in biosciences and the bioeconomy, including human health, food, agriculture, industrial biotechnology, marine biotechnology, and animal health and production. Uh, Meredith also happens to be an old acquaintance of the UMOFA team, as he also authored a chapter of the first UMOFA Blue Bioeconomy report. But today I have a question uh, for him about INTA. So Meredith, you wrote a compelling chapter about INTA. I, I must say I fell for the concept instantly, the idea of farming together species from different trophic levels, such as plants and algae and bivalves and carnivorous fish so that the unused feed and waste is, um, of, of, of uh, species can be converted into fertilizer and feed and energy for the others. And I also know that the concept dates back to thousands of years ago in China. So, but my question to you today is, where are we today? Where do we stand with INTA in Europe and worldwide? Can INTA deliver the environmental and economic benefits it promises? Or if not, what can we realistically expect from it and where? Over to you, Meredith. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Alessandro. So this is a good opportunity to, to look at something that, as you rightly said, is very exciting, interesting, and has got lots of potential. But yeah, where is it in Europe? And the answer to that is kind of bogged down, really, in the um, 
tendency for virtually all of Europe's aquaculture uh, and, uh, and fisheries production, controlled and managed fisheries production, to be monospecific, to be focused on one particular species and to have developed the market routes for those species, to have developed the security of the supply chain and the value chain. And also to have uh, invested heavily, if you look at uh, salmon farms, for example, invested very heavily in the support systems, the infrastructure, the IT, uh, the uh, engineering and similar kind of things that will maintain those in the most efficient way possible. Whereas IMTA, IMTA, by its very nature, is something that requires fine tuning, management, and, and, and quite a good balance between how you put things into the system and how you take them out again. So um, in terms of hoping, as the Canadians originally did in the 1980s and earlier, that salmon farming and its nutritional inefficiencies and its tendency to pollute the environment would be benefited tremendously by uh, growing other uh, trophic levels like mussels and seaweed in association with salmon farms. Um, contrary to that, it's, it, there's been very little uptake. I think one of the um, glowing examples, perhaps, uh, and one that Eric would might be familiar with, is Leroy Ocean Harvest up in up in Norway, who who have made a, a real corporate strategic decision to get involved in balancing the economic impact of the salmon farming with uh, offsetting the uh, the nutritional the, well the eutrophication let's say uh, by growing seaweed to extract nutrients and they they're doing this through a um, an interesting system which i think is probably going to be one that will achieve some success in europe which is rather than growing uh, seaweed right underneath the salmon cages or right round the salmon cages they're actually doing it in a spatial uh, concept where they're taking the nutrient balances in a whole area of water and they've been calculating what the salmon cages produce and what uh, they would need in in terms of seaweed to uh, take up the particularly the nitrogen and uh, and that that has that they've been able to do that then efficiently by focusing on the bits of the ocean the coastal areas that are uh, better capable of managing the growth of both different species effectively. Uh, you could certainly add mussels onto that, but the difficulty with uh, mussels in collaboration with um, with fish farming and cages is that with a tendency to move offshore further, uh, there's more ocean movement and the ability of mussels to take up uh, any particulate matter coming from the salmon farming itself is rather reduced. So that poses a challenge to, to everything. Um, in terms of worldwide, there's probably more going on than we can easily see. China is the vanguard for a kind of integrated multi-trophic aquaculture that perhaps developed by accident. Uh, in their uh, shallow coastal areas, uh, they have been able to take advantage of, of the natural tendency for seaweed to grow very well faced with agricultural and, and human nutrient runoff into relatively slow moving waters from quite wide rivers and the bays that they have there some of which are, are reasonably well protected have provided a really good um, almost almost like a, um, a sort of crucible for more and more complicated inter as time has gone on getting to the stage now where they're considering making artificial reefs out of things like um, bivalve shells and other sorts of objects and then uh, harvesting whatever uh, can actually come in and take advantage of those artificial reefs in a system that's called marine ranching. So we have to watch out that as well. That is something that could potentially be useful, particularly in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. with things like uh, offshore uh, gas or oil facilities that have reached the end of their productive life uh, that are not in too deep uh, water. Um, in terms of the other questions, the, the environmental and economic benefits it promises, the biggest concerns here are to do with really the um, either the in silico modeling, the computer modeling that's gone on based on relatively little information, but extrapolated over a, over a big area. 
uh, or the fact that the studies of this kind of thing have been relatively small scale. And what tends to happen is that as people have looked in real life at the small scale applications of IMTA that have been available, particularly in the coastal areas, they've, they've not been um, as satisfied with the evidence of nutrient uptake and nutrient offsetting. That's one reason why, as I said earlier, it will probably go to a, an environmental balance system rather than a specific site balance. The only offset for that is that benthic, what so-called benthic IMTA could become quite interesting where access to the, uh, the, the fin fish farming and access to the seabed are both easy to do and easy to manage and harvesting of different components is not compromised by putting these together. In the benthic IMTA, you have the water column and you have the seabed beneath. And it's the seabed that is most directly affected by particulate matter from fin fish farming. In the benthic system, you can put strings of mussels or other sorts of bivalves or, or, or you can grow seaweed and abalone or whatever you like round, providing you can control it to some extent. But it's the, it's the sea floor that becomes the focus for high value export uh, items like sea urchins and sea cucumber. And there are people certainly interested in exploring that and putting those things in place. Again, particularly around the southern Atlantic coasts of Spain or Portugal and in the Mediterranean area. Um, where will it go? Who knows? But, uh, but my seven minutes is up quite nicely. And, and I think that, uh, that that's hopefully has given enough food for thought, which fish of course is meant to be very good for the brains but food for thought for the questions that might be coming up in a moment or two. Thank you. Um, well, I have, we have no questions for you right now, but of course that doesn't mean that more may come. In the meantime, I will ask questions and I'll take the opportunity to ask one more question. Um, do we know, uh, I mean, I'm not expecting the exact number, but maybe you have a ballpark figure um, how many uh, IMTA farms there are in Europe, or oh, something like that? What is their production? Yeah. This is quite interesting. If, if, we, if we look at offshore work, uh, there, there are, you can probably count, count the ones that are, that are approaching some kind of economic balance on one hand, fingers of one hand. Potentially, it's Alga Plus down in uh, down in Portugal. Uh, that there is um, Lure, as I as I mentioned before. Um, there are, there are some in the Mediterranean who are looking at uh, using grey mullet as the detritivorous fish, Malta um, and uh, Italy, uh, and these these may actually be achieving something successful. But I'm not. We, we don't have the data for that yet. Where the systems may be, uh, uh, it's a similar system, and I think we do have it classified as IMTA, but it, instead of being species of fish or species of marine animals, it actually goes way beyond that, is land-based systems with re recirculating aquaculture systems. You can link those with horticulture, and that, that is a promising area, providing that the, the health needs of both aspects are very well balanced and the market uh, routes for the produce from both aspects are also balanced and that's going ahead in the UK, in France, in many other countries and I, and I think we kind of need to look at that more closely and, and just get a real feel for that. So for example bringing it into uh, the area that, uh, that Yumofa has recently published on, they had their report on smoked eel and it seems to me that that with, um, with almost 70% of eel production for the smoked eel trade, which is quite a valuable one, in Europe being in aquaculture and a large proportion of that being in recirculating aquaculture systems, then there's a potential there for introducing concepts of IMTA. If they're in open ponds, they, they can uh, certainly be reared with uh, with freshwater fish or with um, brackish water fish like uh, like grey mullet and tilapia or carp and if they're on land they can be linked in with uh, with a horticulture system 
and the mutualities there are, are, are a potential. So th that's something that could be explored as a, as a way forward for increasing the number of establishments that are able to use IMTA successfully. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And in the meantime, we um, got we received a few uh, questions from our attendees. First of all, let me just clarify because we've got a question from Philippe. Could 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 you please at least provide a list of panelists and subjects? We did it right when we started, but very briefly for those of you who weren't here, um, we 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 have in now Meredith Lloyd Evans who's finished his speech on integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. After Meredith, we're going to have Eric from Contali on, on the use of fish rest raw material, then Pierre Hafez from Biomarine on cellular mariculture, and then Mari Stulgis from the European Commission on the EU, uh, the EC initiative uh, for this sector. Um, and of course, we're going to make the content information uh, um, available for these speakers. But Meredith, some a few questions for you. Okay. Uh, and Please, uh, if you can, if you can um, give a quick answer, uh, well, if it's possible at all, because the first question is sort of difficult. We have why hasn't multi-trophic aquaculture picked up more strongly in the European Union? <laughs> that probably requires a new webinar. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I think there it, it's a, it's a, the really complex story of how you justify the investment that's required either in uh, integrating with existing salmon farms, which are dedicated to salmon, or integrating with offshore activities like multi, the potential for multi-use platforms, uh, uh, wind power, or uh, offshore gas and oil extraction. And the conceptualization has been quite difficult. The pull hasn't come from the primary, uh, the primary sector in most cases, the push has been attempted to come from people who are interested in, in the IMTA concept in general. It's come to some extent from the European Union fund, uh, and national, national agencies, of course, funding trials and, and experimental stuff. But they're usually too small scale to provide the kind of confidence that industry needs to make the investment investment organizations, the confidence to give the large sums of money needed for the capital outlay, and uh, quite strangely, insurance companies, the understanding of the risks involved that are in addition to the risks they're used to from whatever the, the main activity is. So it's a, it's a big combination and it's quite difficult for, uh, for small scale producers or, uh, or researcher academics interested in this area to unpick all those different stressor points in this whole chain of trying to do things right and deal with them uh, and hopefully that there's also not an integrated voice in europe if there were an integrated voice and pressure group in europe focusing on this across the whole breadth of the background industries that could support inter then i think we'd probably start moving further towards also integrating the answers to those individual challenges thank you for the question yeah, uh, I think we can take one more. And uh, besides that, there are some comments, maybe not, not, not questions, maybe, but some interesting comments. I mean, uh, just the market in the EU, I mean, a good question is if the market in, in the EU is big enough for the seaweed and bivalves that uh, an IMTA would produce. And as a follow-up, uh, also if um, consumers are willing to pay enough to um, make it profitable. Um, but uh, um, someone else is, is um, pointing out that there's an interesting project in, uh, in, um, in Spain, in the south of Spain, there's a company producing soil in a recirculated aquaculture system. They are using algae for cleaning the water. Uh, and they're doing some assays with uh, oysters, sea brim, old Valatuca in Estoros, brackish water. Another uh -huh. project that has been, yeah, that has been um, pointed out is um, in, in Malta uh, and the project is integrate, uh, integrate yeah, hyphen uh, imta.eu. Uh, but the last question for you then, I'm sorry, I need to pick one, but uh, there are a few more, but we cannot answer them all. Um, last question is from Alexandra. If IMTA is considered as a regional concept instead of farm based, how can incentives be introduced to promote this? 
That's quite interesting though, because that implies that you can bring together the coastal authorities and the local township authorities together with uh, the economic and, and uh, science development agencies of the particular regions concerned. I'm assuming by that that, for example, we might be talking about something like the Submarina region, which is linking, uh, linking countries across the Baltic. Uh, there you do have a, a sort of pressure group, which is the Submarina network itself, which can work on specific uh, questions like mussel farming and how that can be integrated with, uh, with runoff um, nut nutrition, nutrient extraction as part of a, an integrated approach to uh, ecological management. The, but, I, but I think it, again, it's, um, it's a tough one because of all the different bits that need to be put together to make something work and to convince, uh, to convince cross territory uh, powers that they should be working together to achieve something that's beneficial. That, that is, if you can get them to believe in the concept of IMTA in the first place. Um, I, I'm sure that through the European Union, where I feel I'm still an honorary member, if I'm not actually really part of it anymore, um, I, I, think, I think we should be able to move forward, providing that, that the uh, policy discussions keep step with the research, development and innovation findings. So that's something to hope for for the future. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And sorry uh, if we couldn't answer all these questions, but we have three more guests. And well, we'll do our best to maybe uh, answer in writing after the webinar. Uh, so it's now time to move on to my next guest, um, Eric Hess. Eric is a senior analyst at Kantali, Kantali Analyze in Norway. Uh, Kantali is one of the world leading companies when it comes to market intelligence for the salmon industry. But Eric and the rest of the Kantali team also have expertise in the complete value chain of pelagic fish, ground fish, and sea bass and sea bream. And Eric, uh, of course, is a proud member of the Umofa team. And you might remember him from all the other webinars we organized in the past. He's a regular. And so I would like to ask him um, about um, fish restoral materials. Um, well, is it true that uh, there's a lot we can do with the parts of fish we don't eat? Uh, what exactly? And uh, also, this is a bit maybe a, of a curiosity. I've heard that the Nordic countries um, apply to fish uh, an everything but the oink approach. So can you maybe tell me more about that and of your work for the bioeconomy, the blue bioeconomy study? Yeah, thanks, Alessandro. Um, I haven't heard of any fishes that oinks, but there is a fish that grunts like a pig, uh, at least. But uh, the oinks, I haven't heard yet. Um, anyway, it's it's partially true, yeah. Um, and uh, the first part of your question is, um, what sort of utilizations we can do with uh, the rest raw materials from fish was was quite extensively um, covered in the 2018 edition of the uh, Blue Bioeconomy Report. Um, but just to briefly <clears throat> recap what we um, also mentioned there, um, when we talk about uh, the fish rest raw materials, we're talking about all parts of the fish uh, that are removed in order to prepare seafood products for human consumption. Uh, so say you catch a cod uh, and the end products are two fillets without skin and bones, so just pure meat. Uh, those two fillets account for roughly between 30 and 35 percent of the total weight of that cod. So up to two-thirds of the fish is actually rest raw materials uh, in that case. Uh, and that's the head, guts, skin and bones, basically. Um, and globally, it's actually estimated that up to 65% of all fish biomass is wasted. Um, however, these raw materials uh, all have huge potential in terms of, of uh, valuable utilizations. Um, and we mentioned many of them in the 2018 report. Uh, much of the material can be used for direct human consumption. So you have livers, rows, um, a lot of the cutoffs uh, you can mince, so you have, you have minced fish meat, 
Um, much of the um, materials that are not used for human consumption are used for silage and for further production of fish meal and fish oil. Uh, but perhaps the most interesting are the cases of higher valued products, such as enzymes, uh, collagen and refined oils used in pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. Um, the utilization options of course differ between the different species, um, but the concept is the same. We can utilize, uh, if not 100%, then, then most of the biomass. But to achieve that, you need to focus uh, both on the utilization throughout the supply chain and you need to know exactly what occurs, what is available of the material, where it is available, when and in what form and shape. So rest raw materials occur at all stages of the supply chain. Um, depending on the species, fish are gutted and headed and even sometimes filleted aboard the fishing vessels. Now obviously a lot of rest raw materials occur at processing plants. Uh, and some even occur at the end consumer stage when restaurants or us as consumers buy whole products. Uh, we toss the head, we toss the guts, uh, we only keep the fillets. Um, and even though it occurs along the supply chain, that doesn't mean it's available for utilization because when fish are processed aboard the fishing vessels, the cutoffs will often be discarded at sea. Um, and at landing sites, at the auctions, uh, and at different processing plants, if restaurant materials and discards are not managed and stored properly, the, their um, utilization options are quickly reduced. Now, you mentioned the Nordic countries, um, and especially Iceland and Norway have actively worked on monitoring and uh, developing collection and utilizations of restaurant materials over the past, uh, I think, 20 to 30 years. Um, and us here at Contali, we have been involved in analyzing the occurrence and utilization of restaurant materials in Norway for the past 15 to 20 years. And when it comes to Norwegian catch landings and aquaculture, uh, we know the amount of cod heads, salmon blood, trimmings, spines, uh, anything you can think of. Uh, we know their availability and we know how it is utilized. But of course, uh, in, in Norwegian fisheries, the landing obligation is absolute, so all catch is actually landed. Uh, furthermore, 90 to 95 percent of the Norwegian production is exported, so the, the uh, amount of data and available data is huge. Um, and then together with our 15 to 20 years history of networking and interviewing the industry, we have developed a, a detailed methodology uh, driven by detailed data. So for the case study in Denmark, um, in this edition of the Blue, Blue Bio uh, report, we want to test different methodology uh, for assessing the rest raw materials outside of Norway. And it turned out to be a bit more complicated than we anticipated, uh, mainly because Denmark uh, differs from Norway. It's a big, uh, it's a big seafood nation, uh, both in terms of fisheries and agriculture production, but also in terms of seafood processing uh, and trade. So there's a lot of products going in and out of Denmark uh, in different forms and formats. Uh, so it's very difficult to assess which products and parts of the fish are available in Denmark, Denmark at any given time. Uh, and furthermore, and perhaps largely due to uh, the pandemic uh, we are all so aware of, um, we struggle to get in contact with the relevant industry players to get detailed insight and knowledge throughout the supply chain. Um, we did, however, end up concluding uh, on some range estimates, uh, both in terms of the occurrence and availability of restaurant materials and their utilization. So uh, basically there's three options in Denmark. You have uh, fish, uh, fish oil and fish meal. Um, Denmark is the world's largest producer of mink skins uh, and fish is a large part of, of a mink's diet. Uh, and thirdly, uh, as a large agricultural country, um, they have over the past 10 years rapidly increased their capacity of waste treatment and energy production through uh, biogas facilities. So these three outlets for uh, restaurant materials um, um, uh, ensures that almost everything is used. So almost every available restaurant material in Denmark is used. However, uh, these are all uh, on the lower uh, lower end of the value uh, ladder. So 
there are huge potentials for increasing the value of rest raw uh, materials in Denmark. And in fact, going back to Norway and, and, and also Iceland, the long-term focus um, and the monitoring and analysis of the availability and utilization uh, have had an impact on the rate of utilization, uh, which has steadily increased over the years in these countries. Um, and also um, alongside that, the value of the utilization options have also increased, transforming rest raw materials from a costly waste problem to actually being a valuable resource. Um, and actually in Iceland, some of the products from the rest raw material are higher value than the fillets, the, the, the main product. Uh, and I guess the next, the next steps now, uh, and Norway is, um, is taking the next step, and I know there are some uh, similar initiatives in, in several uh, European member states, uh, but they're, we're now part of a broader monitoring and analysis scheme of, of food waste in general across the entire food chain, uh, and not only looking at, looking at fish. So I guess that's the, that's the next step. Very well. Um, we've got a couple of questions for you. I must say that I'm impressed because uh, our participants uh, seem to be ad uh, eager on asking very difficult question, uh, questions. Uh, this one for you is, do you think that the blockchain approach will improve the aquaculture industry? Um, <laughs> um, well, the I, I, the most honest answer is I don't know. Um, I haven't really looked into it, but um, uh, I mean, the, uh, there's more and more focus on traceability, and um, uh, I guess not, even though I don't know too much about the blockchain uh, technology, um, I guess that would increase um, increase the traceability and be helpful. Um, and of course, uh, trying to connect that to rest raw materials, um, it would hopefully make it easier for us to follow also the parts of the products that don't end up at the dinner table. So um, yeah, let's say yes, I think so. Good. Um, then there's, what, what can, I'm not sure, Okay, no, sorry. Uh, this one is, what can Eric say on fish protein hydrolysate? This is another very interesting question. That yeah. <laughs> they do, well, they, people are being nasty. They're asking difficult questions on purpose to yes, try the, the, detailed, the detailed questions. I don't know much about it, really. Uh, I'm analyzing the big data. Um, so I, I don't think I can answer too, too, too much on that one, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, and um, we have another one here, and probably a last one is mink production has recently been fully stopped in Denmark due to a risk of COVID-19 mutation. Um, this re uh, restaurant material is mainly directed towards fish meal and fish oil industry. And the question ends here, but I guess it's clear where we are going. I mean, what, are, what can be the implication? I mean, it's not uh, fish rest raw material, but uh, I think there's a link here with. Um... Well, actually, the mink uh, uh, the mink feed is a large uh, buyer of rest raw fish rest raw materials. Um, we never uh, managed to get in contact with um, uh, the the best sources. So we we never got the confirmation on actually how how large volumes they consume each year. But it's uh, it's a lot. So uh, I think we summarized at the end of our, our case study that the uh, the main utilization method is uh, or option is the um, fish oil and fish meal producers. Um, and then for the mink feed, they use both meal and oil, but also actual actual frozen fish parts, uh, which they mix in with the dry feed. Uh, and then give to the mates. Um, but we never got a confirmation, but, but for the, from the supply chain for um, human consumption, um, mink feed is the second, or pet, pet food, but primarily the mink 
is the second largest utilization options or the second largest buyer of, of uh, rest raw materials in Denmark. So how, how that will continue to develop now is uh, uncertain. Thank you. And then I know I said last question, but this one, well, I wanted to ask it myself. So uh, why not? One more. Um, uh, what, uh, had, what are the main drivers behind higher value chain utilization of biological resources? For instance, Denmark versus Norway, Iceland, etc. cetera. Uh, that's a good question. Um, the main drivers, I think, um, well, in Norway, I don't remember exactly when, but 20, 30 years ago, um, we started with with a landing obligation. So all catch uh, and everything aboard the vessels had to be brought ashore and landed. Um, and of course, that quickly created um, a problem uh, with all the waste, with all the heads, the guts and everything. Um, so we had a lot of resources, uh, we had a lot of raw material um, that we had to make use of uh, somehow. Uh, that's the same issue also in, or, or, or a similar issue in Iceland, uh, where they, uh, when they started with, with uh, tax and quotas, uh, they had to try to increase the value of each kilogram of catch. So even though you catch a cod and 30% is the product, how can we increase the value of the remaining 70? Because we can't catch any more cults, we have to make more money out of the catch we actually have. Um, now in Denmark and in the EU, the landing obligation that's been increasingly uh, coming into force over the past six years uh, is not as rigid as for Norway and I believe Iceland. Uh, there are several loopholes. You can still discard heads and guts, um, and so I, I don't just uh, for and, and Denmark. Yeah, sorry, Denmark is also different because they have fish meal and fish oil production. So um, there's always an outlet for all the restaurant materials. Uh, with the meat production, there's always an outlet to get rid of the offcuts from the processing sector. So the all the salmon trimmings from the filleting processing uh, can go directly to the mink farms. Uh, so there's always an outlet. Even though they're not paying well, uh, it's not a cost for the processors, it's not a cost for the fishers to get rid of the waste. Uh, and I believe that's maybe the main drivers that in Norway it was, um, it started off as a waste management problem. While well, as in Denmark, they had some some some, some outlets, um, and they haven't been forced to find some some valuable uh, utilization options. Brilliant. Well, thanks a lot, Eric. It's always a pleasure to uh, host a webinar with you. I mean, you you're you're a veteran now, and uh, it's I think it's clear why. Your explanations were very clear. So um, now my next guest. Uh, needs no introduction, because if you work in the marine biotechnology industry, you must have run across him. I mean, he's not someone you can escape from that easily. I'm talking about uh, Pierre, Pierre Hervès, chairman of Biomarine, a uh, proud organizer of My Blue City, an entrepreneur, an investor, a man whose connections span from Europe to Australia, from Canada to China, and who knows where else. Hi, hi Pierre. Um, well, Pierre, you remember that when the world was was still normal, I used to see you uh, more often than I get to see my own wife. Now it's been a while since we last met, so I'm going to go straight to the point. Uh, you wrote this chapter on cellular moriculture and plant cell technology. Uh, that sounds like rocket science to me. So now it, the question is very simply, what is it exactly? How does it benefit the marine environment? And Maybe this is a stupid question, but I've got to ask, does it mean that in the future we're going to be eating artificial lobsters grown up in a lab? So thank you, Alessandro. And first of all, you know, I'd like you know, to say that I really appreciate you, but I, I like your, your wife as well. And uh, if we can spend more time together, it's going to be much better in the future. So uh, saying that, um, 
Maori culture is a new concept. Um, it is divided in two main parts. Uh, on one side, we have the plant side, and on the other side, we have what we call the uh, cell base, you know, meat or fish. Um, let me start with the um, easiest one. Uh, I will call it, you know, the cell plant, the cell plant technology. So, what does it look to, well, or like? Um, it's we take, you know, stem cells from plants or from seaweed or from, you know, different compounds that are very useful for the high value markets. And um, we reproduce them at industrial scale using type of bio refinery fermenters technologies. The purpose of this is really, you know, to, to um, not to compete with uh, endangered species and in order, you know, to limit the risk on the harvesting or the cultivation sometime, when you need pure ingredients for the cosmetic, especially, you have, you know, to um, make sure that you can produce exactly the same quality and the same uh, high level compounds for each batch. Uh, the best way is really to get into cell plant technology. So we identify the right stem cells and for the record, some of the stem cells uh, are very uh, expensive. We, we valorize them if it's a very good source of stem cell for uh, a very rare species. It could be uh, up to 150,000 euro per milligram. So it's really valuable. And then you take you know, these stem cells, you, um, you reproduce you know, the first batches and you produce the ingredient uh, with very large quantities. I'm actually representing one of the largest cell plant technology company from China in Europe. And they have a, a, a data bank of very rare plants and stem cells that are uh, very useful in cosmetic and pharmaceutical industry. And they can extract, you know, from this huge quantities at the cost uh, of these interesting compounds. So we're not talking about any competition with the existing, uh, I would say, um, plant-based industry. It's a different purpose. It serves only the very high value market. And again, I'm talking about, you know, these rare compounds like, um, well, elastin, collagen, vegetal collagen-like type of peptide, or, uh, proteins of peptide or a different type of um, neuropeptide that you can extract you know, from very rare plants. And this is the main purpose. The second part, and uh, well, just to give you an example, in France, we had uh, for the marine part, one pioneer, which is CEPIC. And CEPIC, you know, they started you know, to cultivate these uh, seaweed stem cells only for uh, the purpose of developing rare ingredients and good quality ingredients for the cosmetic industry. So there, there are more and more demand. The only problem we're facing at this stage of the development of the cell plant based technology is that you know it's capex extensive. So that means that uh, we are trying to, buy, to build at this time kind of a consortium where even the competitor will be able to join, you know, to advance the research, applied research, and participate, you know, to major, I would say, uh, breakthrough in terms of producing the stem cells, in terms of improving the cultivation, and in terms of syndicalizing uh, the production type. Uh, at this stage, uh, Europe is not very well developed, but there is a huge gap that we can fill very quickly because we have some very good expertise in the field. The second part is more related to the meat and the, the well, the muscle equivalent. So you know very well the uh, cell-based meat, which is a very fast growing market in the US and in Asia. And there is also the same, I would say, uh, interest and focus on the cell-based fish. So what does it take? We take one stem cells from a muscle, from a, or, or from whatever. It could be a stem cells of a sea cucumber collagen, and we reproduce this stem cell 
um, in a very uh, industrial scale. The only problem we're facing so far, because we are at the intensity of you know the technology, is you know the I would say the substrate uh, to grow the cell. We need very high quality cells to grow the initial cells of the fish or the cucumber of the cucumber or you know the meat, and then uh, we have techniques bioreactors likes uh, where we're going to grow the meat. So, so far, you know, the kilogram of meat or fish or collagen produced is ranging from, I would say, 20 in the base case scenario to 250 uh, euros the kilogram. So it's not affordable. And all these startups that are uh, developing in the field, they are cash consuming. They burn a lot of cash. And uh, it doesn't stop you know, the investment because the investors have understood that you know the future of the nutrition will come mainly from these techniques that we're developing these days. One reason you know that in Europe and on the uh, in North American market, the vegan trends is exploding. So on one side you have you know the uh, vegetal base, uh, well, what you call, you know, the, the plant-based food that is expanding very fast. And to compensate, you know, this need for uh, not killing the animal and preserving the environment, more and more people are thinking about this artificial meat or fish or mollusk or whatever it is. And I think that uh, it's a very good approach, you know, for uh, env environmental, you know, issues. Uh, it doesn't compete, you know, with any of the actual agriculture production type. And we are just pioneering the technology. And if you look at who are the investors, the investors around the world, they are, well, behind, you know, the, the startups, of course. They are large meat producers, uh, fast food chains, and, and, and big distribution groups. They have understood that with a population that will grow to 9 billion people, there will be not enough resources for everybody. And we're not considering you know, the ocean as, as a potential playground because sooner or later we're going to face you know, the same issues for plants, seaweed, or even you know, uh, fish. So we need to, you know, to anticipate. And it takes you know, from 5 to 10, 15 years to get a mature technology. So the point is that Europe is very far behind. And uh, I know that it's one of the uh, key focus, you know, for innovation. And I hope, you know, that we're going to be able, you know, to invest massively in this technology. But if you look at the leading companies so far on the market, they are Californian based, East Coast, Canada, and Asia. Most of the companies, they are in Asia, and North America. Only a very, very few are based in Europe. Because of what? Because of the uh, framework and the regulatory framework. And this is something that we need you know, to really look at in the future. Because in the past, we had some very harsh discussion on uh, should we use GMO techniques to get faster development in plant technology? And now we're going to face the same issue. Can we use stem cells or can we use, you know, a similar technology? I'm not talking about GMO for the plant, uh, for the, the cell ground meat, but I'm, I'm talking about new technologies. And will it be allowed in Europe the same way than the regular meat? Uh, it's, it's an arbitrage that the European Commission will have uh, to jump in. Because uh, if we want to anticipate, you know, this potential development, and if we don't want to miss, you know, uh, the turn, then we're going to have to address this point very quickly. Uh, it's it's not an easy discussion, because most of the lobby from the meat and from the agriculture will uh, fiercely defend their position. But I think that from a, a normal perspective. If we want, you know, to think about the population growing at 9 million 
in, in, you know, in 20 years, we're going to need this technique. And this technique will be mature enough to provide good protein at a price for pretty much everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no questions for the moment. So I'll, once again, I'm taking the opportunity to ask one. Um, you, you made it very clear that we're not talking GMO here for obvious reasons, uh, but um, about this new technology is, uh, uh, is, is CRISPR an option, for instance, here in this case? Well, uh, when, when we talk about CRISPR, it's, it's more on the, I would say, uh, vegetal part. If you want to improve a strain, and this is the case already in cosmetic and pharmaceutical, uh, let's take the case of microalgae. You can modify some genes uh, and no, not modifying genes. You can use CRISPR to improve uh, the production of certain ingredients into a microalgae or some cells. So we're not talking about this, you know, with the cell plant. With the cell plant, we're talking about selecting stem cells and producing them at industrial scale. So it's more about the processing of reproducing the cells than uh, preparing the initial cell. You can use CRISPR uh, you know, at the top of this on the technology, you can use GMO technology to manipulate, you know, the chloroplast genome or the cell genome to improve the characteristic of this ingredient. But then after, if you use the cell plant technology, you can put that, you know, in a bioreactor and produce it at industrial scale. And the final compound, you know, will be purified if it's a GMO and not purified if it's not a GMO. So it's two separate things. And for the meat and the fish, we're not talking about improving the characteristic of the cell, the initial cell. It's also a different technique. We are producing, and the technology is based on how we're going to produce faster and at a better price. So if I understand correctly, one of the main barriers here when you mentioned the framework in, in Europe uh, is not that we have legislation that has uh, ruled out a technology. Uh, so, for instance, that might be the case of uh, GMO. Well, it's uh, in, in some countries it's not allowed to to farm GMO. In others, in Europe, it is allowed. But here we don't have a legislation that has ruled out a technology. Here, the problem is that we don't have a framework at all. Is that correct? So there's total uncertainty. And amidst uncertainty, investors and developers from other countries are taking the lead on this. This is absolutely true. So uh, everything has to be defined and invented, and and th there is a white page, you know, to write. So we're not talking about GMO. I guarantee this. We're not talking about um, um, very complicated, you know, technologies. We're talking about massive investment to be able to produce at industrial scale. So it's really how we're going to bring together the key industry leaders in the field to develop you know, this, uh, this technology, both for the meat, for the fish, but also for the uh, cell. But you know, the potential is enormous. Uh, just coming back to the sea cucumber, you know that uh, at this time, um, people, you know, and, and the Chinese market is consuming a lot of sea cucumber, but the collagen is in high demand. And this collagen is very similar to the human derms. So nobody will use it in, in, in Europe because the cosmetic regulation is banning you know animal products but for um, uh, the in vitro testing for the in vivo testing and for most of the uh, i would say medical device application we need more and more sea cucumber collagen and this type of collagen could be produced you know uh, using cell uh, cell uh, cell plant technology so this is something important and i think that in the future the challenge will be is europe the place where we're going to use this technology, or is you know uh, something that we're not considering at all? Okay, and in the meantime, we have a few questions here. Well, one is actually from Meredith. It's not a question; it's a remark. Um, of course, he's right. Fish stem cell product would be regulated, presumably under the novel food regulation in Europe, and CRISPR, and CRISPR would be relevant to increase the polyunsaturated fatty acid kind of nutritionals 
and also for removal of allergens, most likely. Um, yeah. If I can just leap in there and say that the problem with CRISPR is that it's still under a cloud as far as the European Court decision of a couple of years ago as to whether that was included or not in the GMO regulations. So there's still some negotiation to be done on that. Yeah. yeah. And we'll have, you know, the final answer so far. Yeah. And then I have a, uh, a question from uh, participants, a question for Pierre. How efficient is this lab growth of meat, fish, mussel in using the input material? Uh, is it more efficient than full animal growth, which is not always as efficient, making their environmental impact bigger? I'm not sure if you got the questions right. Well, th this is a very good and relevant question, but uh, if you take into account, you know, the animal welfare, and when you look at some, you know, poultry production or pork production, I read a go, you know, for the uh, artificial meat, what you call the artificial meat or the cell-based meat, because you take the best uh, fiber from the muscle and, and you can produce it. And there's no animal uh, concern. It's just a matter of reproducing a cell for developing protein that is testing and guessing, you know, like, you know, the real animal. So for the fish, it's very impressive. I've seen, you know, some, uh, some meat uh, from this uh, Singapore-based company that is reproducing the scallops, uh, crustacean. Uh, I've seen, you know, some of the uh, photos, you know, and it's really like, you know, tuna, uh, tuna mussels. So it's really impressive. And uh, it's just a matter of, of, uh, of cost now so far but in the next five years it's going to be almost impossible to make the difference between the real animal or you know the artificial cell ground fish or meat and and that's that's you know uh, what in the industry is developing right now okay thank you thank you very much pierre um, we're now reaching the end of our webinar so it's time to introduce uh, my last guest uh, Maris, Maris Tulgis is a policy officer at DigiMares Unit A2, where he deals with blue bioeconomy, algae, uh, marine aquaculture, and a lot of other stuff. Um, Maris, you're, you're an ocean enthusiast, and currently you're also driving forward the EU algae initiative. So would you like to tell us something about the initiative that the Commission is taking to support the blue economy? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alessandro. Uh, maybe I would start with, with this specific report because this is really a, a bold example of, of an EU action because it's an it's it's EU policy uh, research action and uh, we need to, to generate uh, quality data and information that is necessary for sound development of actions at, at the EU level. And uh, in case I do not have time, I would really like to, to praise uh, three speakers, Pierre, uh, uh, Meredith and Eric, uh, that contributed to this uh, report and also the entire EO MOFA team and Kogea and also the, my DGMRA colleagues, because this is, uh, uh, may, may look like uh, three uh, un unlinked topics together, but to me they are really uh, very much complementary to the excellent 2018 report on the on the blue by economy, and and, and this is uh, this is this is uh, really great the great stuff to be used, and, and and to me it comes really at the at the right time, and maybe I will further explain why. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, most of you have seen this uh, this slide. So the the European Green Deal is is actually Commission's plan to make the EU's economy sustainable and turn climate and environmental challenges into the opportunities. And the blue boy economy is exactly about that. How to change, how to turn the challenges into the opportunities. I will not go into, into these specific, uh, specific flagship initiatives, but uh, in, in most of them, you can, you can see the links to the blue boy economy and, and to the algae, like uh, for instance, farm to fork, foresee that, that algae could be an alternative protein source. Uh, preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity, uh, algae and, and marine organisms could, could play a big role there. 
zero pollution could you could make a link with the uh, with the uh, IMTA and and so on and so on so if you could go to the next slide please yeah, continuing on the on the policy research uh, and, and 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 better data so uh, the the DG Maris, uh, work was 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 really substantiated uh, on the blue by economy with the blue by economy forum recommendations that really made the recommendations on policy environment regulation finance and business development and and I, as I will further explain based on that we are we are moving moving forward in addition to the blue by economy reports we are also issuing the the annual blue economy reports on a, on a much broader scale where we always uh, also have the blue by economy and an IG uh, chapter uh, there and uh, and the next slide so uh now what we are I, as i said based on the blue by economy forum uh, roadmap that was at the end of 2019 and also based on, on a number of other policy research documents including the, 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 the this report and the previous one the the commission is looking uh, to unlock the the algae potential in europe and uh, in doing this the the, the we, we, we are planning to have an uh, an uh, eu algae europe energy initiative called the blue by economy towards a strong and sustainable eu algae sector and the the public consultation on the roadmap uh, has has taken place uh, end of december early january and provisionally we we have like five uh, provisional uh, objectives that uh, will look at the improving governance framework for instance if there is a need for uh, further guidance on the sector standardization efforts uh, to look at the support of the functioning of the market uh, to look at the novel algae species issue any necessary specific funding mechanisms uh, improving business environment if there are again specific funding needs or maybe a need for a one-stop shop for stakeholders increasing social awareness and acceptance uh, to organize communication campaigns uh, labeling addressing labeling issues uh, looking at the marine special planning of uh, of collocating the uh, blue by economy enterprises together for instance with the wind farms and and also on, on looking at closing knowledge the search uh, development and innovation gaps for instance developing improved algae cultivation and processing systems and looking at the, at the new methods like cellular mariculture for instance at the next slide please so uh and then, then the other uh, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, then the other, the other, other actions that uh, that the commission is doing. Of course, uh, it's just a big helicopter overview. But of course, the the the, the research is a, is a very very bold uh, action action package, and and specifically the the ocean mission in the in the horizon Europe uh, that looks in, in the in the various intervention areas at the the possibilities to develop the blue by economy and algae also the the ocean observation and data are very important AMODNET and not European Atlas of the Seas uh, looks at improving this data so we have blue funds uh, on looking at the blue like blue invest or annual blue economy calls that are uh, yeah linked more to DG Mare uh, the, the reports I mentioned already, also the DG Mare, the, the, the annual flagship event, European Maritime Day. So this year it will take place as a, as a hybrid event in, in Den Helder in Netherlands and the, on the Blue Bar Economy. There will be the Blue Bar Economy uh, stakeholder uh, session and, and also DG Mare policy session to look at the more sustainable food uh, from the ocean. Also, uh, awareness raising, I think, is crucial for the sector because one of the reasons why algae sector is, is, could not really unlock its potential uh, uh, quick enough is maybe the consumer's acceptance as comparing to China, for instance, where there is a consumer acceptance and therefore uh, they can produce 20 million tons of, of, of seaweed a year, while in, in, uh, in Europe this is uh, only, only marginal. And therefore, one of the actions that DG Mare just launched is a, is a taste of the ocean, the first uh, 
series is is uh, is about fish, where, where the chef, chefs, uh, European chefs, are preparing the uh, the dishes from the from the seafood. While later it is foreseen that that it could look at the, at the seafood and also algae, and also the 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 monthly Euro News uh, Oceans episodes that you might be aware of. Uh, also, yeah, we work together with GRC on the with the Knowledge Center for Bioeconomy and, and DGRTD on the EU Bioeconomy Strategy. So we have a collaboration with uh, lots of uh, DGs. It's not an exhaustive list here, so it's it's much more. And and also there are much more initiatives at the, at the EU level. And uh, uh, and uh, not only it's looking also at the at the local and and the regional level. So. My time is over, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, Maris, I see that there's a hand raised by Bernard Fries from the Commission. So, uh, Bernard, if that's okay with you, I'll now unmute you. Okay, you you have now. I have I have unmuted you. You now you have to unmute yourself to to say what you wanted to say. Okay, so perhaps uh, we can maybe maybe he raised the. Uh, uh, his hands by mistake. Uh, otherwise, you can use the uh, the, the the question tab, and, uh, and we'll uh, give you a voice again. Um, I was checking if there's uh, there's some more there's some questions uh, for for Maris, but there appear to be to be none. I must say that well, we we can certainly say that the Commission is not uh, sitting idle with all these many initiatives, and I. And I think uh, I particularly like the um, Taste the Ocean campaign. I, I think it's brilliant. And uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's also a problem with consumer acceptance. Uh, on the one hand, we can see the shelves in our supermarket filled with uh, high-end products that are using algae or are using spirulina. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I mean, at the same time, there's also it's also difficult to penetrate the market um, for, uh, you know, um, when it comes to food. Uh, so it seems that this, there is a market for algae as a food supplement, but not as pure food. I think the, and of course, this is uh, in stark contrast with the Chinese experience. Uh, but I see that Pierre would like to say something about that. Please, please Pierre. Yeah, on the seaweed side, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity, you know, for the European market, because the main problem, you know, from from Asia is really the heavy metals and the pesticides that we're going to get, you know, into the seaweed, and it's not proper, you know, for human nutrition. When it comes to Europe, it's not perfect, but in some of the Nordic areas and even in the Mediterranean Sea, we can cultivate. Uh, a very good quality seaweed, red, brown, or green, that is absolutely matching, you know, the needs from the new human nutrition, and we can produce even much more. You know, uh, we're all talking about, you know, the pandemic these days, but uh, I'm working with this Austrian pharma company that is using MSP, marine sulfated polysaccharide, coming from red algae, and I can guarantee that you know, within two months, they will be about, about you know, to, to announce that you know, it's proven in the treatment of COVID. So seaweed has a great potential, not only for COVID and, and, and IT virus, but it's also the great potential for human nutrition development and all, all from for also feed and cosmetics, of course. Yeah, right. Um, then we have a question for Maris. Um, well, two questions actually. First, um, from Margaret, from the participants, is there a specific or dedicated initiative for algae innovation, or is it embedded within these various other initiatives? Yeah, I would. Uh, there is uh, nothing that specific that is dedicated only to algae. Of course, this is uh, this is embedded into the 
uh, mostly I think in, 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 in Horizon Europe and then of course uh, there is knowledge center for the for the bioeconomy there is also blue bioeconomy industry joint undertaking and and in each of these there are there are various calls uh, that that support the the algae uh, blue bioeconomy and including algae algae innovation so the idea with the eu algae initiative is 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 really to uh, to link together all these all these various uh, needs and and have a focus bolder focus on the on the blue by economy and algae and and, and elaborate a, an, an action plan plan of actions that could really add the value at the european level and help to unlock the the, the potential of algae okay and um, yeah and i suppose that the EASMAS blue economy window also applies in, in it sort of absolutely funds. yes absolutely yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just uh, closed, by the way, or it is about to close. Anyway, it's uh, it's uh, a new window from is open uh, by Yasme every year. So um, another question, and I think that's the last one. Uh, it's uh, for Maris. This comes from Meredith. So Meredith, I'd like you to ask the question yourself. Thanks very much, Alessandro. Th thanks very much, for Maris, for explaining that things are moving ahead. But one of the areas that's always concerned me is that uh, innovation gets funded and yet because of uh, policy disparities and regulatory disparities and management and control disparities between different member states and different regions of the EU and between different zonal authorities, many of these innovations just don't go anywhere. The, uh, as Pierre's talking about, there's difficulties with many of them in getting investors on the side. And, and so my question is, where in the five objectives that you set out for this contribution of the blue bioeconomy to the Green Deal, uh, is this whole difficult challenge of making sure that these different elements actually do harmonize their approach and do take on board the, the need to help uh, innovations that, that we hope will come out of this and not simply say, oh, you know, it's it, not our job to do this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Meredith. That's 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 really a pertinent question. And and of course, we know that that uh, often, often, unfortunately, this uh, this is uh, the case. But of course, even now, the the Horizon Europe is already also, the previous framework program is already looking at the higher uh, TRLs, uh, actually, to make the developments that are closer to the market. Meaning that, yeah, if there are innovation developments, that of course you need to think at that stage how to move uh, move this closer to the market. Of course, this is part of the of the impact assessment that that we are starting uh, this. I think this this week uh, to prepare this EU EULG initiative and these uh, five, as I said, were provisional objectives. And of course, uh, yeah, I I I. I mentioned number five was closing knowledge research and innovation gaps but but you are absolutely right closing i mean doing the research without bringing it to the market and to real life this doesn't make much sense you really need to establish the the, the, the mechanisms and, and, and structures in place that these innovations that the cellular mariculture is introduced in in in, in, in real life that any other innovations that they that they reach the market and of course then yeah support or functioning of the market this is something uh, yeah also clearly linked to that if you if the market needs uh, innovations then these innovations need to that that should be direct link and then there should be the, the direct uh, interaction among the, the the relevant stakeholders well i hope it might be possible to do it through the uh cross dg groupings that would be discussing the whole thing but also maybe through things like multi-annual strategic plans that each of the member states are uh, obliged to bring forward and to agree to, to at least carry out as best as they can some of the elements. So, uh, because I think that will give a lot more hope to people that this is, that this is going to move forward and that the opportunities presented by algae are, are going to make a real contribution to the Green Deal. Thank you. Okay, 
the, the time the time has flown guys and i guess that's the end i uh, i'd like to apologize to all the participants who didn't see the question answered well we had uh, one hour and 15 minutes uh, but but please rest assured that we'll do our best to answer in writing um, and uh, I would like to thank everybody for this webinar, um, my guests, um, the participants of course, the UMOFA team and of course the European Commission who are funding UMOFA and are making it possible. Um, I might be biased but I found this very interesting and I hope to see you soon uh, for a new talk. And last but not least, um, a video recording of this uh, webinar will be made available on YouTube. And all of you who signed up for it will receive a newsletter with a link to the video and with the um, answer to the unanswered questions. So thank you very much. Uh, until the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.